Hello, Dr. Sean. How are you today? Yeah, good. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark. This is Dr. Sean. We're from Adjusted Chiropractic. We're here. Very excited today to be speaking to you, Dr. Sean. Another research article with regards to uh, COVID recovery. Um, um, you did comment when I showed you the article that it was all underlined, and that's true because there's so many <laughs> great points that we want to be speaking today with regards to this. The title of this, um, this article, which is actually published in June, on the 28th of June this year uh, in Minerva Medical uh, Journal, uh, the original entalicum supplementation improves lung fibrosis and post-COVID-19 lung healing. Um, look, I think it's hugely important to understand that there is this research that is getting done, has been done, and we want to go through the improvements today. Uh, well, not the improvements. I want to go through the summary of the results today. So I've got some notes which we'll go through. Yeah. So first of all, let's uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about. Uh, so the title is improving lung fibrosis. Let's talk about what lung fibrosis is and why would there be lung fibrosis that needs to be healed after COVID nineteen. Yeah. So the the process uh, when someone gets COVID. Um, you've got that, that first stage where you're getting viral replication. It's all about the viral load. And quite often, depending on how much viral load you get, will determine how severe your symptoms may be. Um, so it, in the earlier stages, if we can, we want to minimize that, that viral load. Um, but then once you're through that stage, you, you get that inflammatory process. They call it the, the cytokine storm. Uh, and that occurs in the lungs. So it's basically uh, an inflammatory process that occurs. Yep. And then um, if that hasn't been curtailed or that hasn't been um, taken care of at that point, we then get to, this, to the third stage. Mm -hmm. um, and that being, um, that being uh, thrombosis, blood clots, which a lot of people have been hearing about. Uh, yeah, they're so in the lungs. This is the big issue with COVID. This is the, the, dip, the point of difference that makes this virus more significant over others. It's the ability for it to create thrombosis in the body and, and, and blood clotting. Yeah, uh, and, the, and this, is the only, um, this is the only one that does it. So this is, a, this is a new thing that we're actually facing, which is quite interesting. I think a lot of people don't realise that. They think it's uh, the same as others or, you know, it, it, you know the, the process from start to finish is the same, but this is very different. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is why we're talking about these things. This is why we're bringing these types of research and recovery articles to um, our patients and to our community uh, to understand that there is something that can actually be done. So let's go through the, nut, the, the, the nuts and bolts and the, the guts of this uh, article and this, what, it, what it actually showed. Okay, so this, this study was conducted and the healing time uh, for these people as part of the study was uh, eight months. So it went over eight months. So first thing that this says to me is it's quite an extensive period of time. You know, healing for eight months, that's, is that normal to be healing for eight months or it's too long? Yeah, well, you wouldn't expect this in like your average virus. And this is something we're seeing. Uh, people call it uh, long COVID. Uh, it's people experiencing symptoms ongoing for quite a significant time after they've had the initial, uh, the initial fever and the initial flu type symptoms that they get. Um, but they'll experience issues long term, fatigue, issues with the lungs and breathing, and yeah, uh, there's a, a whole bunch of things that sort of people aren't talking about. I know some people who've experienced uh, like hair falling out and you know more susceptible to other infections and. Yeah, there's a lot of things that can go on for you know the following six, eight months after you've you've had it. Yeah, exactly right. So this so this study was done using 19 subjects, 19 people with pneumonia. So they actually had the pneumonia. So um, you know that happening in the lungs from COVID-19, um, and therefore obvious lung damage. And I'm going to go through how that was actually tested. Uh, now you and I have been through COVID. Um, and pretty safe to say, um, no pneumonia, uh, and the extent, the extent, uh, well, I'll talk on my behalf, uh, the extent of lung damage, thrombosis, et cetera, none to very, very minimal. So, you know, why I say that is because uh, this study was done on those who had uh, progressed way down the track to uh, significant lung damage. 
So why this is good, why this data is very good and why this research article is good is, is pycnogenol and things like that can help these people who they got it a lot worse uh, those recovering, such as yourself, myself, I mean, I, I test my recovery, my good recovery to, you know, pycnogenol and vitamin D and vitamin C and just super dosing with those. Uh, what do you find? What did you find? Yeah, well, yeah. as we've said before, we were taking uh, the five times dose uh, every day of pycnogenol and it's a supplement that we've, I've been taking for uh, probably about six, seven years now. Um, but even now, like it's, it's been three months since I had it. Um, I've still been, uh, taking an increased dosage of pycnogenol every day. I've been having at least two serves every day, um, just to help with the, the recovery. If there was anything, I mean, I feel great. I don't have any noticeable, uh, effects, but I, I want to, especially after seeing this kind of research showing the long-term benefits, um, it is something that I'm staying on top of. Yeah, and I've been continuing to take it too, and I haven't seen any uh, decrease in lung capacity or anything like that. So walking, yeah. uh, running, cycling, anything like that is 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 back to pre what it was. So it's yeah, really good. Um, okay, so let's get into this. So CT scans were used to confirm lung fibrosis in this study. So it's not just, um, you know, oh, this person has lung fibrosis. It was actually tested. You know, CT scans are actually taking images um, of these subjects' lungs. So that's quite significant. 10 uh, people, so 10 of these patients were treated with pycnogenol. Uh, so they were, they, were, they were treated with the, the supplements. Um, and nine subjects, they served as controls. So they didn't get any uh, supplements or anything like that. They just had their natural recovery, uh, I suppose. So 10 in one group, nine in the other group. First of all, oxidative stress was noted that it was high in all subjects initially. Um, that, so the, the oxidative stress was high initially that decreased significantly in the supplement group. Okay, not the control group, the supplement group. Uh, these are similar findings to what we were speaking about previously when we were talking about recovery from microcirculation um, and cardiac, uh, cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, those listening to this, if you haven't seen that one, we put up, I believe, last week as another great article on recovery too. Um, so that's quite significant. I think that's great. Um, the also results show that the uh, Konofsky performance scale index significantly improved in the supplement group compared to the control group. Uh, now that um, that performance scale index is one uh, which uh, gives the patients questions on a day-to-day -day basis of how they're functioning uh, in the home, at work, etc. Uh, this is quite significant. So symptoms uh, such as fatigue, muscular pain, dyspnea, so shortness of breath. Uh, were significantly lower after eight months in the supplemented patients as compared to controls. Um, now that's good, um, but uh, everyone out there listening is probably going, eight months, why have we got to wait eight months? Well, also the study showed preliminary results after four weeks showed that symptoms associated with post-COVID-19 lung disease were already significantly improved in the supplement group. Mm. Now we've had patients who have we've encouraged to take uh, pycnogenol um, after COVID. Um, how have you found it's worked for your patients, Dr. Sean? Yeah, so in particular, after seeing uh, this study and the other one that we did last week, uh, I know a couple of people who have experienced issues with um, just lung capacity and their, their cardiovascular endurance uh, ongoing for months uh, and didn't really seem to be improving uh, and so put them on uh, the, the dosage in, in here it was 150 uh, milligrams. So it was uh, six doses uh, of the one that we have here in the clinic. And within a week, uh, immediate differences, uh, the tightness in the chest opened right up, uh, was able to uh, perform uh, feeling almost back to normal. So uh, it was quite significant, quite dramatic how, how quickly it was effective as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. No, very, very good recovery. Um, okay, so also at the end of the study, the small cystic lesions, and they call it, it's called honeycombing in the lungs, um, and, and traction bronchiectasis was stable or in partial regression in four subjects in the supplemented group versus none in the control group with a significant improvement in tissue edema in the supplemented subjects, all of them. 
Um, there's a lot in there. Um, people who are listening to this probably are not going to understand what honeycombing is and bron bronchiectasis and, and everything like that. Do you want to summarise that, Dr. Sean? Oh, it's basically the scar tissue that's, that's occurring in the lungs. So uh, there's a study that's quite interesting um, that I saw years ago, more than five years ago, that they were using pycnogenol and they were, I think it was with rats, and they were cutting the, the skin and then just measuring how long it took for the body to repair and um, fix and create the scar tissue, but then remodel that scar tissue into healthy functional tissue. And the average uh, of just the, the normal amount of time would be about 14 days. Uh, if they were taking, it was pycnogenol, but they'd turned it into like a paste, like a cream, uh, and they'd have full repair within 11 days. So it cut like three to four days off the healing time. Um, so as much as we can see that in the surface of the skin, um, the same thing is happening on the inside of the body. So any, any scar tissue that has occurred, we're getting a, an increase in how quickly we're repairing and laying fresh, healthy tissue in the body. Yeah, yeah quite extraordinary recovery. And the mechanisms and the physiology for how this happens is we don't have enough time to go through it. But study after study just shows that this is how and this is the, uh, this is the recovery that the tissue can actually go through. Um, okay, so now also in the results on ultrasound lung scans, um, the white fibrotic components of the supplement group were significantly improved, whereas there was no improvement in the controls. So the fibrosis or the scar tissue that had been created in the lungs of those patients in, in the study, um, on ultrasound, the, um, the supplement group was significantly improved, but the controls were not. That's pretty significant. You know, that's, that's really Yeah. Mm. So it's basically saying that you know, if the body is not helped along with regards to recovery of scar, etc., it's probably not going to do it and it's probably never going to do it. Um, you know, and I don't even have to, um, you know, we don't even have to get into those with, uh, you know, previous lung capacity issues or, you know, those who, um, no, we don't even have to get into other things that damage the lungs, even pre-COVID, like, you know, cigarette smoking or other things like that. I mean, it's, it's just unfair to have, um, you know, the lungs, um, you know, scarred and, um, you know, fibrosis in there as well and not giving a chance to actually heal. Um, yeah, yeah, amazing, actually. So, um, yeah, so we had the, um, the preliminary results were after four weeks. I wanted to do a, a, a halfway mark or a, a checkpoint along the road to see that there was actually uh, improvements as well. And that also showed improvements in oxidative stress was reducing the, the uh, Kronofsky performance scale index was significantly improving in the supplementary group as compared with the um, controls. And the summary basically was stating that it, it did um, speak about uh, the importance of recovery um, of lung tissue after pneumonia post COVID-19. But this also does highlight for us what we've been speaking about because we've, we've sort of been speaking about in the past, Dr. Sean, haven't we, with regards to the immune system. So firstly, keeping the immune system boosted so we can be and possibly resistant to COVID-19, any infection, viruses, et cetera, we want to keep our immune system boosted. So we've, we've spoken about the immune system protocols. Then the immune system protocols step into the cytokine storm. So what we do for five days while we're going through the cytokine storm. Now, this gives us the data and a bit more of an understanding of what needs to happen in the weeks to months after we go through COVID-19 and giving our body the chance to recover. So, um, you know, there's, there's almost those three, those three different components, as you were speaking about beforehand, of the three different um, time processes of the disease itself. So should we just summarise that again a little bit for everyone listening? Yeah, so those three stages, as we mentioned, it's the, the replication of the viral load, um, then you've got the, the inflammatory stage and then you've got the uh, thrombosis and the, and the blood clots. So if we can do things at each of those stages to assist the body, um, then we should be able to recover from this thing a lot more successfully. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, now you've been through it. Uh, you went through COVID and I've been through it as well. And one of the things I, I remember asking you when you were going through the process and I experienced it for myself firsthand, 
I asked you the question of um, what, uh, you know, when, when the um, health department called you, et cetera, what did they give you in the way of advice, treatment? You know, you're at home, you've got to isolate, everything like that. What advice were you given um, by the health department at that time? Uh, to drink lots of water. That's it. Um, and um, like I was given, it's like, uh, if you have trouble breathing, call an ambulance. <laughs> and then uh, I also remember the questions of whether um, um, have you been coughing up blood as well so uh, and that is an obvious uh, question to uh, well if we have well, then we've obviously got um, lung damage okay so thrombosis in the lungs that's why we'd be coughing, coughing up blood the issue is that uh, so many people are and this is the way this is what is failing is that most people are left at home having to isolate and waiting, they get through the, um, they they go through the viral replication stage, and that's you know that's pretty painful, to say the least. They go through the cytokine storm uh, phase and the inflammatory phase of the of the disease as well, and there there is no treatment. They're not doing anything. They're just mm -hmm. resting, um, not really getting any help. Maybe they haven't been taking supplements, vitamin D. Doctor Sean, we know, is very very important. Uh, this mm -hmm. reminds me of another article that has, has just come past my desk on the importance of vitamin D, which I'm going to be speaking to you about very, very soon. Yeah, uh, they move, yep, let mm -hmm. me show you that tonight. Uh, they move through to the thrombosis stage. And this is not good. So this is anywhere between day seven to day 14. Uh, and now they're getting uh, blood clots, et cetera. And now they're in real uh, dire straits. And then this is where most people will call the ambulance, can't breathe, go to hospital, and then the authority. Uh, what, you, what can you say? Blake? Well, with, we know with pretty much every, every disease and every illness that early intervention, early treatment is one of the most important things. You, you can't wait until people are on their deathbeds. Crucial. That the, the intervention is going to be successful when the damage is already done. Um, mm -hmm. we, we need to get in there early. We need to yeah, have boosted the body in the first place and yeah, given it that support while it's going through these stages rather than waiting to the end. Okay, so we can summarize that again, just to stress that it's very important to keep the immune system boosted. Uh, and hopefully, look, we, we combat COVID-19 to start with, but, you know, as long as, you know, if we do still uh, get it, well, then at least we've got the, you know, the, the nutrients, et cetera, to go through the, you know, viral load and the cytokine storm uh, quicker and easier. Um, definitely going through the cytokine storm, we want to up those dosages like we've been speaking about. So just summarising that. In the recovery phase, uh, we also want to be doing things in the weeks to uh, months afterwards because we've got to give the body the right nutrients and time to recover as well. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome research, Dr. Sean. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your uh, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts on this as well. We'll continue to bring uh, these types of um, articles and research to uh, those out there just to understand what's going on in the disease a little bit more as it continues to progress. But um, if anyone has any questions for us, we're always available. So please give us a call. I'm available personally. Dr. Sean is happy to speak to anybody as well. Any of our team can help you. Um, thanks, Dr. Sean, for your time. We'll leave it there. Thank you. See you, everybody. Have a great day. See you guys later. Bye.